Our Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus and praise you and worship you and love you. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege that's ours just to teach it and, and love it and live by it. And uh, Lord, I, I pray today that you would um, allow us to truly hear from you. Uh, Lord, I know that, that nothing really happens in our lives uh, unless you do it. We can read the Word and, and study the Word, but without the power of the Holy Spirit, nothing changes about us. And so we ask, Lord, that you would, by your grace, allow your Spirit to teach us and to help us understand. Uh, Lord, we, we pray that above all else, that you will be glorified. Glorified in our words, glorified in our thoughts, glorified in our very actions. And Father, we will thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, um, go ahead and, and open your Bible to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. And uh, that's where we're going to, uh, <clears throat> to pick up today. And uh, for those that are joining us online, which is becoming a uh, larger and larger group as time goes by, uh, we're in, in Acts chapter 3 and getting ready to look at a, the first 10 verses. Acts chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 1 to 10. Now, let me, uh, let me just remind you a little bit about uh, where we are and, and, and what we're doing in this class. This class is is like other classes, uh, really, but a little different uh, in that they've given us the freedom, uh, our pastor and staff have given us the freedom just to take a book of the Bible and just walk through it verse by verse. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's what we're doing. We're just taking the book of Acts right now. And a few weeks ago we started. And, and we're not going to be in any hurry. We're going to take plenty of time. And like we did a couple of weeks, if we get into a section that takes a little longer uh, than just one session, then we'll make it two sessions. Uh, but um, the, the key to expositional study, <clears throat> study of the Word of God is to take God's Word and just unfold it. Uh, one of my dear friends, Tom Elliff, uh, explains uh, expositional teaching this way. He said, it's like having an orange in your hand. And, and you look at that orange and you, and you know that there's something in that orange that's really good for you. But you've got to take the, the peel off. And so you start taking the peel off of that orange. And the next thing you know, you've got a ball of orange slices in your hand. And, and you're still not to where you can enjoy it too much yet. So now you've got to start pulling the slices apart. But once you pull those slices apart, then you can feed on that. And then you can really enjoy it. Well, that's what expositional teaching is. It's, it's taking the outside of the Scripture, <clears throat> reading it, studying it, beginning to pull it apart, uncover the meanings of words, uncover the grammar, uncover the historical background, all those kind of things. And finally, you pull those things apart and you begin to feed on the Word of God and you say, man, that is really good. And, and, and one of the things about expositional teaching is when you get used to it, you, you, it kind of becomes a habit for you. you. You get used to that. And after a while, you just say, man, that's what I want to do. And, and one of the things I hope happens for us in the class as well as online is people will learn to do that for themselves. And that's one of the reasons that as we go through these verses, there'll be times that I'll say, this is what this word means, and this is where we got that meaning, and this is how we understand that. Because one of the things I think is really important is <clears throat> that you can learn to take the Word of God and open it in very unique ways and study it these ways. And in fact, uh, I got an email from a young man the other day who was raised in our ministry. And uh, his first words to me, he's now a young adult, and his first words were, Pastor Ted, thank you so much for teaching me how to study the Bible. Well, I never sat down with him in a class and said, here's how you study the Bible. All I did was just model expositional teaching. And on his own... He learned then to do that. So that's one of the great advantages of expositional teaching. So this morning, uh, <clears throat> we're going to begin in Acts chapter 3. And here in a moment, I'm going to read to you beginning in verse 1. Um, let me remind you where we are. 
the last couple of weeks we've been talking about the church that Jesus started. And in Acts chapter 2, we see that church. Now, one of the things we discussed last Sunday is that the church that Jesus started is a willing church. There's just a willingness to serve. You, if you go back and look at Acts 1 and 2 and 3 and on through the first four or five chapters, really, uh, before you get to Ananias and Sapphira, when you get to Ananias and Sapphira, things change. But, but prior to that, there was this willingness to serve, just this desire to serve and to give and to, to be a part of what God was doing. And, and so what I want to do today is I want us to look at a picture of willingness. I mean, if, if, if I say to the Lord, in fact, even this morning, as I was looking through this and praying through it, I found myself saying, Lord, would, would you just make me willing to serve you? God, would you, would you take me at my age and my place in life, and, and would you just, just make me willing to really serve you and to serve your people and, and to be a part of your kingdom's business. One of my, one of my greatest uh, fears, I guess is the word, is I just never, ever, no matter what age, you know, and, I, and I know physical things could come in and could change everything up, but, but I just never want to get to the place that I'm just kind of hanging out, you know? Man, I want to be serving and being used and being willing for God to use me in whatever ways He might do that. And, and I'm sure you pray that. God, let me be willing. Well, well what does willingness look like? If, if, when we look at this passage of Scripture we're looking at today, we ought to be able to walk out of here in a little bit and say, that's what willingness looks like. I can do that. That, that's what it means to be willing to serve the Lord and follow the Lord and walk with the Lord. I can do that. Now, I may not do it exactly as Peter and John do it, but I can do it. And so look with me in chapter 3 of Acts. Uh, and uh, I love this entire story. It goes through chapter 3 and chapter 4. And so we're going to kind of be in it for a few weeks, okay? Because there's just some wonderful truth that we don't want to miss. So we don't want to hurry. But, but I want you to look with me in, uh, in verse 3 now. Or in chapter 3, excuse me. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb. Now let that soak in for just a moment. A little later, we're going to see this guy's over 40 years old. Okay, now he's been lame from birth. Now there's a spiritual significance of that we'll look at in just a little bit. All right, he's been lame from birth. And a man <clears throat> who'd been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to sit down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were in the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up. And immediately, his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Boy, I bet he did, don't you? Forty years? Walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And, and they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And isn't that a beautiful story? Uh, you know, I, I love to uh, just kind of paint pictures of, of stories of the Bible in my own mind. 
not on canvas, but in my own mind, I see this guy, he's <clears throat> extremely poor. For 40 years, from the time he was born, he's unable to walk. You, you go back in his life, and don't you know that at some point, as, a, as an infant, as a baby, it, maybe even the day he was born because he was crippled or whatever it might be, people said, he's never going to walk. He'll never walk. His life will never be worth anything. He's going to always be a beggar. He's going to always have amazing needs that nobody can meet. And, and, and one day, all of that changes. He, he's at the temple, which we'll talk about here in a moment. He's been taken there for years. Probably had some friends or, or, or somebody from family that took him all the time there, and, and that's where he would beg, and we'll talk about why he chose that particular place in a moment. But, but there he'd be, and one day, these two guys come walking up. And, and, and Peter and John, he doesn't know them from the man in the moon. But, but they come walking up, they see him, he sees them, their eyes fasten on him, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And he, you can see him, he, he puts his hands out for money. And Peter, he says, man, I, I don't have any silver and gold. But what I have, I'll give you. In the name of Jesus, the Nazarene. Now that's significant. This Nazarene, this Jesus the Nazarene that they crucified. This Jesus the Nazarene that their government didn't want. This Jesus the Nazarene that their religious leaders mocked. But this Jesus the Nazarene that was resurrected from the dead. And Peter had already preached about that. And 3,000 people had come to the Lord at Pentecost. That Jesus, in the name of Jesus the Nazarene, get up and walk. And immediately he does. Now, now paint that in your mind. Now, now here's, here's what I want us to talk about. What was it about Peter and John that made them so willing? I mean, you know, 3,000 people had come to Christ in that time. Don't you think that during that time that they were still going to the temple, that maybe some other believers had walked by that guy? Sure they had. You think maybe there were some other people that, that, that saw him and didn't offer anything? Maybe some people that looked at him and maybe turned their heads and, and, and just another beggar, or maybe some people that's always there all the time and, 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 and never did anything. And yet these guys are so willing. So is there something we could find in the Scripture that would help us be willing? Is, is there something that we could find in the Scripture that, that would cause us to have our hearts and our minds so opened to the Lord, that He could use us in unusual ways and different ways. So, so let's, let's walk through the Scripture together. And here's the, the first truth that I want us to, to talk about. Willingness, willingness, willingness looks seriously at needs. Willingness looks seriously at needs. Now, now, now folks, listen. I can look all over our church and find needs. I, I can look all over our community and find needs. I, I, can, I can walk in my neighborhood and find needs. I can communicate with just a few people and find needs. And, and, and every one of us know needs in the lives of other individuals. But, but one of the things that can happen is we can get so used to seeing needs that we kind of quit seeing needs. We can get so used to hearing the struggles of people that we kind of quit hearing their struggles. Now, now, I want you to notice something. Go back with me uh, to verse 3, or verse 1, I'm sorry, in chapter 3. And, and, and I, I love the way it begins. It, it just begins with now. Now. Now, you go back to chapter 2, 
And that's when the people, <clears throat> they had this in-gathering of 3,000 people were saved. And then we, then we saw they were continually devoting themselves in verse 42 of chapter 2. They're continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everybody kept feeling a sense of awe and wonders and signs were taking place. And verse 44, those who had believed were together and they had all things in common. In other words, they're having an amazing work of God in their lives. They're experiencing God in a marvelous way. And you get down to what we know of as chapter 3 now, as Luke is writing this to us, and, and he says, now, it's, it's kind of like uh, the Lord says, okay, church, I've brought you together. You've had this marvelous experience. You're fellowshipping one with another. You're praying for one another. You're seeing one another. You're, you're giving to one another. Now, here's this guy that is absolutely not a part of you. What are you going to do about him? Here, here's this guy that has not been touched by what you've been touched with. What are you going to do about him? You see, folks, if we're not careful, we can so enjoy what we have as a church. And, and aren't we blessed with what we have? My goodness, we don't want to belittle that at all. But if we're not careful, we can get so wrapped up in ourselves that we forget the guy that's just outside the door or just across the street or maybe just next door that has never experienced what we experience. And so, so, so now the Lord in His providence has Peter and John. And, and, and look at what happens. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple. Now the, the grammar of that up to the temple. Peter and John were going up. The, the grammar of that says, this is just what they did every day. And Peter and John were going to the temple. I mean, it's kind of like us. We get up on a Sunday morning, we shower, we dress, we get our Bible, we get our stuff, and Ted and Jerry were going to church. That's, that's what's happening here. Now, these guys obviously are still Jews, and there were three times a day that they, that they went to the temple. This ninth hour was three o'clock in the afternoon. But, but there were three times that the Jews went to the temple for prayer. Nine o'clock in the morning, noon, and three o'clock in the afternoon. All right? Nine o'clock in the morning, noon, three o'clock in the afternoon. Now, so these guys are doing what, the, what they always did. But, but this day, there was something different. Now, 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 look at what happened. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple about three o'clock that afternoon, hour of prayer. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to sit down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. Now, there, there, were, there were three places that people would, would go to beg. They, they went to the homes of wealthy people. They went to intersections, major intersections, where, where people would walk and... And, and traffic would take place, all that kind of thing. So there's a lot of people there. Or they would go to the temple. And, and many times they went to the temple at the hour of prayer because the Jewish people, in their understanding, and their doctrine, they're going to the temple trying to appease God. Now, Peter and John aren't for that, and the other believers aren't for that. But the average Jewish person, they're going to please God. They're, they're going so that God might be pleased with them. And the people who are begging also understand that, that they're trying to please God by giving alms to people. And so that was a very common place for a lot of people to be who were, who were begging and were in great need. And, and, and so they get there. Now, now look at what happens in verse 4 or verse 3. When they, and when he saw, by the way, that word saw, we've seen this word before. Sometimes it's translated to know or to perceive. It, it's the word oido in the Greek language. And it's the idea that, that you're just kind of locked in. You know something completely, know something totally. It says, and when he saw Peter and John about to go in the temple, he began asking to receive alms. So he gets their attention. They're going into the temple, and, and he's, he's asking, would you give me something? Can you give me something? And then it says this, but Peter, along with John, and I want you to look at this phrase, fixed his gaze on him. Now, uh, folks, that word fixed is the very same word that we saw in Acts 1.10. Now, Acts 1.10 is, in, in fact, let's just turn back in your Bible right quickly if you want to do that. Um, Acts, Acts 1.10 um, is when Jesus is ascending. 
All right? He's met with his disciples. He's told them that he's going to leave. He's going back to the Father. And then it says in, in 110, And as they were gazing intently, that's the same word. All right, now, now remember what we talked about? Do you remember what was happening there? I mean, just imagine, here Jesus is, and they're all close with him, and all of a sudden he begins to rise, and, it's, it's, it, and they're looking. I mean, you, you can imagine they're looking. And he begins to move up, and after a while he's, he's above their heads, and after a while he's above the trees, and after a while he's up in the skies. And don't you know, now, now think about what they're experiencing. Don't you know, boy, they're looking, and they're, I still see him, there, I still see him, there he is. I can still see him, and finally, I mean, they... they they were just locked in on him. Okay, now, now that would be easy, right? But now there's something different. Peter's doing the same thing to this guy that has a need. Can, can I uh, be, be real honest with you? Sometimes I, uh, I look at needs and don't look at needs. Sometimes I, 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 I see struggles in the lives of people and it would be really easy just to kind of say, well, I'm going to pray for you. But see, willingness says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lock myself in on your needs. Willingness says, I, I am really looking at your needs. Willingness says, I'm, I'm not going to miss this. I, so when, when the scripture says in verse 4, but Peter, and that's interesting to me because you have a lot of people going into the temple at the hour of prayer. But Peter's different. And John's different. And, and, and folks, you and I are different with needs. Uh, I, have a, I have a friend of mine uh, that if I were to call his name, you would know his name. Um, very... Um, involved man in our city and business and all that kind of thing and he has a vision and I don't mean by that a, some kind of a unusual I see something nobody else sees it's just a vision in his heart and, and, and he's, he's, he's worked this out and he's got ideas about it and all, he said my vision Ted is that one day every time there's a great need in Oklahoma City that the leaders of our city would turn to the churches Wow, wouldn't that be something? I mean, you think of all the needs we have in our city, all the school needs, all the, the, the crime needs. All, wouldn't it be something? And, and, and not only does he have that vision and that idea, he's got plans for it. He's working at it. He's, he's involved in it. And in fact, part of the ministry that Jerry and I do in the week of coaching pastors and coaching pastor's wife, that's a part of that vision. And, and, but, but, but I love the vision. Wouldn't it be something if, if when there's a need in our cities that the city leaders would say, we got to go to the churches. Well, I, before that ever happens, folks, we'll have to lock in on the needs. We'll, we'll have to say, I see that. I, I'm not just going to overlook that need. I am going to look, I'm going to fasten my eyes on that need. I'm really going to see that. Uh, and I think there's something going on here that we, that we don't want to miss, miss. Obviously, they're seeing... His physical need. Now, his physical need, he's been lame since birth. He's unable to walk. He's unable to make a living. He's unable to support a family. If he has a family, probably doesn't have a family. And, 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 but, but I think there's something beyond that on spiritual needs. See, for not only do we want to see the physical needs of people, but we need to look beyond that and, and see the spiritual needs of people. O over the years, as a pastor for 45 years, uh, I, I saw a lot of physical needs. I remember when they opened up all the casinos around. And you could, you could almost put it on the calendar. The benevolent needs in our state just skyrocketed. You, you could just almost... In fact... When the casinos and the Tulsa air began to open up, we had to increase our benevolent budget because there were so many needs that were going to come out of that gambling industry. I mean, you really could just almost put it on the calendar. It was an amazing thing 
how that began to happen. But, but as we begin to deal with those benevolent needs, I remember saying to my staff, look, we've got to get beyond that. We, we've got to get to some physical things. There's some physical problems here, but there are some spiritual problems going on. And in the needs of people, folks, let's not just stop at, at, at their physical needs. Let's get beyond that to their spiritual needs. Now, I, I want you to see this is so interesting. Lame from birth. The scripture is very, very significant there. Um, verse 2, And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb, lame from birth, unable to walk from birth. Um, lost people are lost at birth. Lost people can't walk through this life successfully. People who don't know Christ, it, it's as if their life is lame without Christ. And they were born in sin, they were born without Christ, they were born needing a change. Just like this man needs a change, just like he needs to be able to walk, just like he needs to be able to get through life. It was that way from birth. Well, with all spiritual needs, you want to look at these kind of things. He's carried along by others. Now, this is interesting to me, and, and, and I, I want you to look at something in just a moment. Uh, look at this in verse 2. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along. And they used to sit down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg the alms of those who are in the temple. In other words, everything about this man, basically, somebody else had to do it. Somebody else had to get him, dress him. Somebody else had to carry him. Oh, maybe, apparently, he's got arms that function, and so maybe he can feed himself, but somebody else has got to get the food. Basically, everything about his life, now listen carefully to these words, everything about his life is in somebody else's control. Folks, do we understand that for those who do not know Christ, everything about their life is under the control of the evil one? I, 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 you know, I used to have a lot of young people, high school age young people in the churches where I served, and for whatever reason the Lord gave me an ability to relate to young people. and I always loved them and cared for them and wanted the best for them. And, and, and I can remember times... These little 14, 15, 16-year-old girls or 15, 16-year-old boys, they'd start telling me about this new boyfriend or new girlfriend they had and all this. And, and, and the first thing I'd add, I'd say, well, do they, do they know the Lord? Hey, buddy, this, this little girl that you're really interested in, does she know the Lord? Hey, sweet little 15-year-old, does this guy that you're so excited about because he just got his driver's license, does he, does he know the Lord? Because if not, that person that does not know the Lord is absolutely under the control of the evil one. This, see, this is a perfect picture of a lost person. In fact, look with me uh, in your Bible. Turn back to 1 John. And, and I want you to see something. 1 John, toward the end of the Bible, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Um, 1 John uh, chapter 5. Uh, verse 19. Because this, this, this is a perfect picture of 1 John 5.19. Okay? Now, now look at this. 1 John 5.19. And of course, Apostle John writing, writing to the church. And he says, We know that we are of God. Now let's, let's stop right there. We know. Now that word know is that, is that word that means full knowledge, which we've seen before. So, so a, a, a saved person has full knowledge that they belong to the Lord. They, a saved person has no doubt they belong to God. Doesn't mean they're perfect. Doesn't mean they don't make some mistakes. But, but, but when somebody knows the Lord, they have the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit has come to live within them. And so there's something they know about themselves. They know that they know the Lord. And, and aren't you glad that John didn't say, now we know that we're perfect. Or we know that we don't ever make mistakes. Or we know that we're always right. That, that's not what he said. But, but, he, but he does say, we know that we are of God. Okay, so that, that's, that's what we know. And that the whole world lies. Now stop right there just a moment. The whole world. And that, 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 the, uh, when John uses that phrase, the whole world, he's not talking about 
every person because he's already said we know we are of God. But he is talking about the general world. That this world in which you live, this world in which I live, I mean, you, you, can, you can turn on the news this afternoon and you can see a part of the whole world, right? You can see the violence of the world. You can see the politics of the world. You can see the disease of the world. You can go outside after this time together and after the worship service. You can see cars going by, going to eat, going to do whatever. That's part of the world. You, you, can, you can look at the schools. That's part of the world. You can look at the hospitals. That's part of the world. This world in which we live in. Now look at what John says about the whole world. This is fascinating. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies, look now, in the power of the evil one. Now let me, let me uh, expose that verse just a little bit. The word lies there is a very interesting word. It's to lie down, but it's, it's the same word as to lie in a coma. Now, uh, my, uh, my mother, before she went to be with the Lord, was in a coma for a while. And, and, and so I can, I can relate to this. Uh, for those uh, hours and days, everything that was done for my mother was done by somebody else. Because she was in a coma. She, she, she couldn't turn herself. She couldn't feed herself. She, she couldn't communicate with us. Every, I mean, she was in a coma. Now, now, now think about that just a moment. We know that we are of God. And that, now that word that refers back to know. We know that we are of God and something else we know. What we know is that the whole world lies as if in a coma in the power of the evil one. In other words, something we know is that this world outside of Jesus Christ is absolutely under the total control of the evil one. Lost people under the control of the evil one. People who don't know Christ running our cities, running our schools, under the control of the evil one. People making decisions for us that don't know Christ under the power of the evil one. Well, think through that for a moment. Think of where our world's headed. Think of what we're seeing. Think of what we're watching. Well, we are seeing the evil one in absolute control over this world. In fact, if you look at verse 19, it's really interesting because you'll notice the words, the power of, are italics. And we talked about that. And, and again, I'm teaching from New American Standard Bible. But words that are in italics are words that were placed there by the translators. They're not in the oldest manuscripts. So when you take those words, the power of, look at this. Take those words out, look at what it says. We know that we are of God. And that the whole world lies in the evil one. They are in the evil one. They are a part of the evil one. Now, folks, do you, do you see when you go back now to this lame man? I think Peter and John are not only seeing his physical need. I think they're seeing his spiritual need. The evil one's got that guy's life. Now, I'm not saying by that that all disease and stuff are the evil one. But in this case, that was the case. Peter, Peter is saying, the, the evil one's got this guy, John. We've got to do something about this deal. Okay, so, so willingness says, I'm really going to look at the need. I'm going to look at the physical need. I'm going to look at the emotional needs. But beyond that, I'm going to look at the spiritual needs. One of my best little friends in the world is a young lady named Lindsay. And um, I, I first met Lindsay on a Sunday morning at South Tulsa Baptist Church. And Lindsay, at that time, was a, uh, was a young lady. She's still a young lady, but she was in her early 20s, I think. And uh, Lindsay walked into our building. I'd never seen her before. And she came to some of our greeters. And the greeters brought her to me. And they introduced her to me just for the, this is for our second service. And they said, Pastor, this is Lindsay. Her, name was, her last name was Gray then. Her name is Akaya now. And I'll tell you about that in a moment. But, but this is Lindsay. And, and Lindsay 
needs to see somebody. And I said, well, Lindsay, what can I do for you? And she said, well, Pastor, uh, my brother was killed in a drug deal. My 16-year-old brother was killed in a drug deal, gone bad just down the street at Walmart last night. And I don't know what to do. I said, well, Lindsay, I know what to do. And I said, as soon as this service is over, we're going to help. So she was with some of our ladies, and they took care of her through the service and all that. Well, long story short, I helped Lindsay and her mother get through that service. was a part of all that. The, the young man that shot her brother was arrested, so we went through the trial and the, the, all that with Lindsay. She, was a, she spoke for the family at the trial, the sentencing, all that kind of stuff. We went, went through all that. But in the midst, I'll never forget... That, that, that first day I went over to Lindsay's home and her mother was there and I walked in knew they had all these needs but as we began to talk it became obvious to me that Lindsay and her mama didn't have a relationship with the Lord and I had the joy of leading them to Christ baptizing Lindsay into our church some time went on she met a precious young man named Kwaku and uh, Kwaku lived here in Oklahoma City they met through some business things I ended up doing the wedding for Lindsay and Kwaku. Uh, they've been married now for several years. Uh, just this last year, they had this beautiful little baby named Madison, Maddie. And Maddie was born early, and so she was in the, the pick you stuff for a long time. And I got to walk through all of that with them and, and, and all. But, but when, I, when I see this lame man, I, I think Peter and John were looking beyond the physical need to the spiritual need. And that's what willingness does. See, willingness won't turn away. Willingness won't say, I don't have anything I can do. Willingness says, I see this need. I'm going to lock myself in on this need. And boy, when I get to this place, I find myself saying, God, make me that way. Do that in me. Don't, don't let me see needs and not meet those needs. Not, don't let me see needs and just walk away. I want to fasten my eyes on those needs. Because it could be, beyond the physical, is a spiritual need. Now, let, let, let's move along quickly. Boy, there's a whole lot there that, uh, that we could talk about, but, I, but we, need to, we need to move along quickly. Not only does, does willingness um, look at the need, but willingness gives what's available. All right, now let me make a statement to you, and then I'll, then I'll back it up, Okay. Uh, you and I, we have more available to meet needs than what we realize. We have more available. To meet in fact, as believers in Christ, we have within us the potential, the opportunity to meet most needs. Most needs. In fact, I'm convinced the church, the body of Christ has the potential to meet all needs if we ever just got into it. I mean, you just imagine all the needs of the world that the church has really decided we're going to meet needs, we're going to love people, and we're going to look for spiritual needs. I'm convinced that it's amazing what we could do, but, but let's just think of us as individuals. Now, now, I want you to see something. Willingness gives what's available. Now, now look at what happens, all right? Um, verse, verse 4 but Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him. said, look at us. Well, that's an interesting statement. Um, are we willing to say to the world, look at us? Are, are we willing to say to the needs, look at us? We're going to meet you. Look at us. It's an interesting statement. Look at, see what we really are? See, see, see look at us. And so he asked the guy, look at us. And he began to give them his attention expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, and don't you know this was disappointing to that guy? The first thought. Peter said, I do not possess silver or gold. I wonder if the guy was saying, man, that's what I needed. I needed your money. That's what I needed. If, if, I, just, if I just had some money, I'd be good. And boy, don't we see that in a lot of folks today? If I just had some more money, if I just had some more stuff. And, and, and to be quite honest, folks, there's not enough money that any of us have to re meet all the needs in the world. 
And, and there are times in our lives, <laughs> we'd say just like Peter, silver and gold have I none. But, but, but look at what Peter says. Look at this. But he said, but Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold. Now look, I love this. But what I do have, I give to you. What an amazing statement. What I do have. Now, in other words, Peter knew what he had. What, what do I have? And, and when I think about needs and, and being willing, what, what do I have that people need? Oh, there's some times that we can help folks a little bit with finances, but this is far beyond that. What I have, I give. And folks, let me, let me ask you now. As a believer in Christ, what do you have? Well, you have Jesus. Okay, and that's pretty easy to say. But, but let's, and, and this is uh, not that you can go beyond Jesus, but let's, let's kind of dig into what that means. I have Jesus. You have Jesus. So what do I have? I have the Spirit of God dwelling in me. You have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. If you're a believer in Christ, okay? All right, now that I have the Spirit of God dwelling in me, what do I have? Well, I have the fruit of the Spirit living through me. Well, what's that? That's love, peace, Patience, joy, all the things that Paul puts out for us in Galatians. Understanding. What, what are some of the greatest needs people have? Love, joy, peace, understanding, long-suffering. Scripture says, you know what long-suffering is? That's the opposite of short-suffering. Short-suffering says, I don't have time for you. Long-suffering says, I've got all the time you need. Long-suffering says, or short-suffering says, I'm busy. I've do. I got to meet this need and get on to other things. Long-suffering says, I, I'm just here for you. I'm, I'm just here for you. Um... See, I, I think what we need to do is to stop and think about what we have. It's, it's most of the time, whatever financial help we could give, sometimes it's wonderful and good, and I've seen financial help really get folks over a hump, and sometimes that's really good. So I don't, so I don't want to just cut that out. But that's not what this being taught here. It's not the idea here that we got enough money, we can take the... No. He says, silver and gold have I none. I don't have silver and gold. I do not possess silver and gold. But what I have, I give you. And then he says this. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. Boy, I love that. In the name of. In the name of. What's that mean? In the name of. It means in the power of, in the authority of. But I think more than that, it's in the character of. It's, it's in the character of Jesus. Walk. Jesus wants you to walk. Jesus wants you to be loved. Jesus wants somebody to care for you. Jesus wants somebody to understand you. Jesus wants somebody to be patient with you. Jesus, in the, in the character of Jesus. Well, folks, listen. Uh, I may not have silver and gold. And I may not even have the power to tell somebody to walk. But I do have love. And I do have grace. And I do have patience. And I do have joy. See, that's what we have. And willingness says, Lord, I, I may not have money to help 
with that need. But what I have, I'll give. I'll, I'll, I'll give my heart. I'll give my time. I'll give my energy. What I have, I'll give. And what I have is Jesus. That's what I have. And I'll give His character. So, so willingness says, I, I will give what I have. I, I'm, willingness says, I'm looking at the need. I'm fastened into the need. I'm gazing at this. I'm not turning away. And, and that that I have, I'll give. Um, Jerry was praying this morning uh, before I came, praying for our class and for our time together. And uh, we had picked up one of the little um, Christmas boxes for kids, you know, that, that we do as a church. And uh, <clears throat> Jerry had gone out last week and bought the stuff and filled up the box and and the last thing <laughs> the last thing she said to me was honey be sure and take the box with you today well i grabbed my bible my notes and walked out without the box it's still sitting on the piano bench okay i will get it but but as she was praying this morning that, that we, we did a box for a little girl from age four to nine she started praying for that little girl A prayer of beauty to Lord I don't know who that little girl will be I don't know where this box is going to go but God would you would you help that little girl know you would you help that little girl love you would you protect that little girl would you keep that little girl safe what was Jerry doing that that I have I give that's what was going on that that I have I give see that's that's willingness willingness says I give what's available. Here's the last truth quickly. And I love this. Willingness associates with the need. Now, oh, here's what I mean by that. Willingness associates with the need. In other words, we, we don't, we're not willing just so we can say, okay, I was willing. We're, we're not willing just so we can say, okay, God used me to meet that need. That, that's not the idea. We are willing, and in that willingness, there is an association. We, we connect ourselves to the need. We connect ourselves to the individual uh, the best that we can. Now, this is interesting to me, because I want you to look with me. Uh, look now as we go into, into verse 6 and 7. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. And I love this. And seizing him by the right hand. That word seizing is an interesting word. It means a firm grasp. It, it's not just a, a light touch. It's not just kind of getting hold of a guy. But it's the idea that, that man, I am going to be in your life. I am, I am I am, I'm meeting your need. I'm taking a firm grasp. He seized him by the hand raised him up boy here's the miracle immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened with a leap he stood upright beginning to walk now look at this verse 8 and he entered the temple with them in other words they didn't say in the name of Jesus get up and walk he gets up his feet get strong his ankles get strong he starts to walk they didn't say great have a good day Come with us. Be with us. Be in the temple with us. Be a part of our life. We, we, we don't want to just meet your need and send you on. No, we're, we're, we're getting into somebody's life. You see, I, I think this is such a picture because you go back to chapter 2 and, and, and what are they doing in chapter 2, verse 46? Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house taking their meals together with gladness, sincerity of heart. You see what Peter's saying to this guy, Peter and John? Hey, we got, we got folks sharing life. Come be with us. They're going to the temple. We got some friends in the temple every day. Come and be a part of that. 
We, we, we don't want to just meet your need and send you off. We want, we want you to be a part of us. And so they seize him. They take him into the temple. Now, as you go through this, this passage of Scripture, it's, it's so interesting. You go through the passage of Scripture, and eventually we'll get there. Peter preaches another sermon, and then Peter and John are arrested. All right? And they're threatened. Now, go with me over to verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 13. Now, they, they told the story of this man. Now, now look at this. Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were educated and untrained men, they were amazed, I love this, and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Now look at the next verse. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, he's still with them. Some time has gone by. He's still there. They, they, they've brought him into the group. He's now part of their life. You see, willingness that doesn't just say, I, I'm going to meet some needs, but, but willingness associates with folks. Willingness says, I, I, I want to be in your life. Willingness says, let's live life together. Let's, let's do life differently now. Let's, let's be a part of your life and you be a part of ours. So, so I don't want us to get the idea that willingness just says, okay, God, use me to meet a need. I, I, no, I think willingness says, Lord, use me to change a life. Lord, you, use me to get into somebody else's life and draw them into your kingdom. Be, be a part of, of who they are. Um, willingness never just meets a need. Willingness associates with the need. So, we, we, we go back here to the church that Jesus started. And we saw some amazing truth about the church He started. It's, it's the redeemed. And we talk about talked about what that meant. It's people of prayer. It's people of fellowship. We talked about all that 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 means. And it's people of willingness. Lord, the church you started is a willing church. And, and, And willingness stays with the needy. Willingness seriously takes a look at needs. And, and, and willingness gives what's available. And, and, I, and I think if I were to just try to clamp down on one thing that maybe we ought to walk away from with today, it would be that, Lord, I have more than I thought I had. I'm not talking about my money. Lord, I have more than I thought I had. I have you. And I have your spirit. And therefore, everything that people need, really, I have in me. So show me how to give what I have. Wow, don't you love that? Isn't that an exciting ten verses? That God could just absolutely take our lives and change us and, 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 and use us. I, I can think right now. Of, of Jerry and I live in a wonderful neighborhood. We love our neighborhood, love our neighbors and friends. And I can just think right now of some friends in my neighborhood that have have some unique needs. I think of a single dad that's got some teenage daughters. It's pretty unique needs. I, I, I can I can think of a an older gentleman about halfway down the block from us that he's alone. And, and every time I see him, he's out with his walker trying to walk his little dog. Got some needs. Man, I have, through Christ, what is needed to meet those needs. So Peter would say to us, in the name of Jesus, use what you have. Wow, let's, uh, let's pray together, all right? Our Father... We uh, bow before you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when I, when I look at, at those verses, Father, 
my heart stirs. I, I find myself just saying, Lord, whatever I have, use it. Show us needs, Father. And, and let us really fasten our eyes on those needs. And use what we have. And, and then not to be satisfied just meeting a need. But to really bring those folks into our life. The church you started, Lord, was a church of willingness. Help us to be people of willingness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.